This is the Inside the Boards podcast. You're listening to an archived episode of the 2017 Study Smarter series. If you'd like to help support Inside the Boards, check out the Inside the Boards All Audio Q Bank. We feature content in our first and second year version from Osmosis and Lecturio. And for the third year version, we currently have content covering medicine, pediatrics, and surgery from Online MedEd. For immediate access, go to insidetheboards.podbean.com. As always, thank you for listening. Hi, I'm your host, Elizabeth Beeman. Welcome back to the Inside the Boards Study Smarter series. I have another microbiology episode for you. Our question is, a five-year-old girl is brought to the pediatric office because of a fever for the past three days. Her mother reports her daughter also has a constant cough and runny nose. After speaking to other parents from the daycare her daughter goes to, some of the other children have also experienced similar symptoms. The mother believes that her daughter is allergic to eggs and so only receives vaccines absolutely required by her school. Physical examination reveals a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius or 103 degrees Fahrenheit with injection of the nares and oropharynx. Which of the following is the most common complication of the most likely diagnosis? And the answer choices are choice A, asthma, choice B, bronchitis, choice C, febrile seizure, choice D, otitis media, or choice E, pneumonia. And the correct answer is choice D, otitis media. Otitis media is a very common complication of this diagnosis, and the diagnosis is influenza virus. So, Let's go about why we knew this was influenza. First of all, we have a young kid. She's five years old, and that's a very common age for flu to be transmitted. Really, all populations are susceptible to flu, and all people should be getting the flu shot yearly. But that brings us to our next point. This kid is not getting all of her shots. It's alluded to that the mother is only getting the shots the school absolutely requires. If you know about the influence of vaccine, that would be something that is often required in healthcare workers and sometimes required at schools. But unlike many of the shots that you get at various ages at the doctor's office, the influence of a shot is not usually a mandatory shot and is not usually required. So that kind of is a clue of the diagnosis right off the bat. They're giving you that information. Also, the child is having flu-like symptoms. She has injection of the eyes, and she's got a cough, a runny nose, and she's febrile, 103 degrees. The patient is most likely at risk for the complication of acute otitis media because this is the most prevalent complication we actually see with influenza virus. And it's accounted for by the fact that Flu leaves the body susceptible to bacterial opportunistic infections in the respiratory tracts, in the upper respiratory tracts, in the sinuses, specifically otitis media, bacterial infections, as well as viral infections. It is also believed that the flu virus itself can cause otitis media. So this is seen in actually 10 to 20% of patients that are positive for flu. Let's talk a little bit more about viruses because we haven't really gotten to talk about viruses much yet. So what are the big kind of classifications for the structures of viruses? So we can really kind of be reminded of that. So we have naked viruses with an icosahedral capsid. We have enveloped viruses with an icosahedral capsid. And we have enveloped viruses with a helical capsid. And then we have to remember that the lipid bilayer is what we're going to see in the enveloped virus with the icosahedral capsid. We are going to touch on that again in a minute. But remember, the lipid bilayer is how we can get surface proteins. And those surface proteins are important because they are part of the virulence mechanism for the virus, but also part of our host defense. So they, they tie into us creating vaccines. Antigenic shift is part of this. We'll get into it in a second. Let's go through viral genetics really quickly. They have four main mechanisms by which viruses kind of have their own unique way of being pathogenic and affecting their DNA and their protein synthesis in ways that help them be better at infecting humans. So recombination is the first mechanism. This is 
something that you should know. It's just two chromosomes crossing over, blah, 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 kind of sharing genes through this mechanism. They can come up with viruses that are resistant to drugs or resistant to host defenses, yada, yada. Reassortment is another good one that is used for viruses with segmented genomes. The one that we need to remember that has a segmented genome is influenza virus. The fact that influenza virus is able to use the segmented genome to exchange genetic material allows for very virulent strains of this virus, like the H1N1, because there was a lot of reassortment of viruses from pigs and viruses from birds and humans, all within a similar strain of the influenza A virus. They were able to recombine, reassort and, and recombine into a virus that was not only difficult to prevent with a vaccine, but happened to be very virulent and did result in a lot of deaths and actually was a pandemic. So reassortment is a very important tool for, for these segmented um, viruses. Complementation is when two viruses are infecting the same person or present in the same place, and one of them makes a non-functional protein and the other virus is able to use that non-functional protein and make it functional for both of the viruses. This is a very simplistic way of stating it, but the important thing to remember is that complementation is the reason that hepatitis D needs hepatitis B to be present in order for it to be infective, because hepatitis D does not have the envelope protein in order to replicate. It needs hepatitis B surface antigen in order to be able to replicate and infect a host. So remember, hepatitis D is dependent on hepatitis B being present. And then the other mechanism is phenotypic mixing. This occurs with infection by two viruses in one host at the same time. Phenotypic mixing is essentially when some of the proteins created by the genome of one virus are used by the other virus and vice versa two viruses infecting at the same time and both kind of increasing the pathogenicity, the virulence and infectivity of each other, making this bigger, badder virus. So recombination, reassortment, complementation, and phenotypic mixing are the four viral genetics we need to think of. Most importantly right now for our discussion of influenza, we need to be thinking about the reassortment because of the segmented genome. Let's get back to influenza and talk a little bit more about that specifically. Remember, H-flu, Haemophilus influenza, is a bacteria, not the same as the influenza virus that causes the flu, and that's not what we're talking about. Haemophilus influenza is different. We're talking about the influenza virus. That is a result of an orthomyxovirus, is in the family orthomyxovirus. It's an enveloped, negative sense, single-stranded virus with eight different segments. So the segments are what causes the virus to be constantly changing through reassortment and the reason that we have to get a new flu shot every year that contains the viral strains most likely to be seen in the upcoming year. That does require some kind of guesswork on the part of the researchers and for this reason there are years where the flu shot works better than other years. We should also remember about influenza that is an RNA virus. Remember that it is a nucleocapsid surrounded by an outer membrane with these glycoproteins inside the membrane. So remember I talked about we need to talk about this membrane again? Here it is. There's two kinds of proteins you'll remember in the outer membrane of influenza, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase active proteins. Anchoring the proteins inside the lipid bilayer are the M proteins or membrane proteins. There are three types of influenza virus, A, B, and C. A is the only one that can infect things other than humans. So we really are talking about that right now because we're talking, we were talking about the H1N1 strain that kind of stole some pieces from a pig version of the flu virus and a bird version of the flu virus. It was also able to affect humans. And the antigenic differences in the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase protein spikes within the lipid bilayer are the reason that these vaccines have to change every year and it's part of the craftiness of the flu virus because our immune system will learn to recognize a certain arrangement of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase 
And then the virus will change through reassortment, change the hemoglobin and neuraminidase, and they're also called HA and NA proteins. And then our immune system no longer recognizes it. Now let's go back and talk about the answer choices. So choice A, and Again, the question was, patient with influenza-type symptoms, what's the most common complication of her diagnosis? We knew her diagnosis was influenza virus, so what's the most common complication of that? And we answered correctly, otitis media. The first choice, A, asthma, would have been possibly a correct answer in a patient with concern for aspiration of aspergillus. Aspergillus spores are everywhere. They're a mold spore that floats in the air all around all of us, actually is the cause of bread mold. Uh, Some people will develop an asthma-type reaction to the aspergillus spores. Probably these are people who already have asthma and just have never had an asthma exacerbation at that point. Probably unlikely that the aspergillus is actually causing them to develop asthma. However, this asthma is not a, a complication known to flu. Bronchitis was choice B. That is the essentially hyperplasia of the mucus secreting glands and the bronchi. It's not a common symptom associated with influenza infections. It can be triggered by viral URIs, allergens, and stress, and is seen a lot in patients who smoke. However, it doesn't fit the clinical picture here. Not a um, most likely complication of the influenza virus. We will remember that mycoplasma pneumonia causes a mild self-limited bronchitis and is actually the number one cause of bacterial bronchitis and pneumonia in teenagers and young adults. Choice C, febrile seizures are real, and we do definitely learn a lot about them in medical school. However, they are an uncommon complication of seasonal flu. They're much less common than obtaining a bacterial infection that causes otitis media. Choice D was otitis media. It's seen in 10 to 20. Some studies even say up to 50% of patients with influenza, but it is definitely very prevalent. And choice E, pneumonia, is occasionally seen with an influenza viral picture because this can leave the immune system suppressed and can lead to a state where there's an increased susceptibility to bacterial superinfections. A patient with pneumonia would most likely present with some kind of trouble breathing. And if the vignette was going to show you someone with pneumonia, they'd have to give a little bit more. And studies have shown that otitis media is still far more common in young patients with influenza than pneumonia is. A few takeaways that we can add on just to remember. This child was five years old, but remember that we never give aspirin to a patient, especially who is infected with influenza or varicella chickenpox, because they can develop severe liver disease, brain disease, also known as Rye syndrome. It's not known why Rye syndrome occurs exactly, but the important thing for you to know is that it can occur if aspirin is given in under two years of age. So always give Tylenol for fever in children. Also remember that otitis media is the most common complication of influenza virus and that streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of otitis media in children and strep pneumo is the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adults. We can treat influenza with amantadine, romantadine, also tamivir, our neuraminidase inhibitors can shorten the course of influenza A and B. And since this patient didn't get all of her vaccines, and that's probably what led to her being infected, or could have anyways, let's really quickly run through to make sure we know our live vaccines versus our killed in our subunit. The live attenuated vaccines shouldn't be given to patients who are immunosuppressed, and we need to be very careful in a patient who's HIV positive and make sure there's not yet immunodeficiency before deciding to give any live attenuated vaccines to these patients. HIV positive patients who do not have signs of immunodeficiency should still be given these vaccines and should be given them immediately, in fact, so that they can develop immunity while they are still able to without the increased risk of having a reactivation of the virus and the virus reverting to a virulent state that could be potentially harmful. So the live viruses that we talk about are smallpox, yellow fever, rotavirus, chickenpox or varicella, Sabin polio, and MMR, and influenza, but only the intranasal formulation of influenza. 
We also have the killed viruses. These ones cannot revert to a virulent state. Rabies, influenza, the injected form, sulk polio, and the hepatitis A vaccine, which you might have gotten if you've ever studied abroad or been to a place where this is more prevalent. Remember, this is the one that is transmitted by essentially eating things that contain the virus. And these are very stable and killed viruses don't convert to a virulent state. And then the other kind of viral vaccine is the subunit vaccine. We have two big ones you should know. HB, hepatitis B virus, has a vaccine that uses the hepatitis B surface antigen to create antibodies against it. And human papillomavirus has a subunit type vaccine that prevents and will fight off infection with HPV types 6, 11, 16, and 18, those being the serotypes that cause over 80% of infections that lead to both increased risk for cervical cancer and genital warts. So those are the two essentially clinical reasons that we tell patients to get human papillomavirus vaccines. So that is all for our little influenza virus question, and I will see you on the next episode. I'm your host, Elizabeth Beeman, and I have another episode for you in our Study Smarter series, the microbiology portion, to get you ready for a step one. So here's our question today. A 24-year-old man is brought to the emergency room because he fainted 20 minutes ago in a nearby pharmacy. He recently returned home from a two-week mission trip to Western Africa during which he was outside most of the day building new homes. His temperature is 39.2 degrees Celsius or 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulse is 115 a minute. Respirations are 18 a minute. Blood pressure is 92 over 64 millimeters of mercury. Physical examination shows that he is unresponsive to verbal and painful stimuli. His skin appears to have a yellowish color and he exhibits small breathing. Complete blood count is significant for thrombocytopenia and severe anemia. A blood smear is done to confirm the diagnosis. Which of the following parasites is most likely the responsible pathogen? Answer choice A, Plasmodium falciparum. Choice B, Plasmodium malariae. C, Plasmodium oval. D, Plasmodium vivax. Or E, Leucaria bancrofti. And the correct answer is... A. Plasmodium falciparum. You'll remember that Plasmodium falciparum is the causative agent of cerebral malaria. So this is basically an encephalopathy picture caused by malaria. This happens when cerebral capillaries and venules are engorged with erythrocytes containing mature Plasmodium falciparum. Remember, all of the malarias work by bursting red blood cells in one time frame or another, and they will enter erythrocytes. With Plasmodium falciparum creating this encephalopathy, you're going to see fever and neurological symptoms, including coma, as the presentation in a vignette. Of the four species that we do know about that cause malaria parasites, only Plasmodium falciparum is lethal and causes cerebral involvement. Cerebral malaria is actually the most common cause of coma in tropical areas of the world. The brain is engorged with static, space-occupying, parasitized red blood cells that obstruct the microcirculation, so the patient essentially is having ischemia throughout the brain. This selectively will target white matter vessels um, more than gray matter vessels. The clinical hallmark of malaria in general is fever. And tracking how often the fever happens will tell you, for the purpose of answering these questions, which parasite is causing this malaria. So let's just go over the other answer choices so we can kind of suss out the different ones. Choice B, Plasmodium malariae, is the variant that is responsible for fevers recurring on a 72-hour cycle. This is referred to as Quartan fever. You can remember that the people that started naming these uh, considered zero days between fevers to be the number one. So three days between fevers or 72 hours before fevers is called Quartan fever. Again, that's Plasmodium malariae. So if a fever started on like a Monday, it returns on a Thursday. Plasmodium oval, choice C, is one of two plasmodium variants that cause fevers recurring on a 48-hour cycle. The other one is plasmodium vivax, choice D. 
Plasmodium oval and Plasmodium vivax both can form hypnozoites, and these will be dormant in the liver and are actually treated with primaquine. And then choice E, Eukarya bancrofti, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but this is also transmitted by a mosquito vector and is the cause of elephantiasis. As the worms slowly multiply in the lymphatic system, they eventually begin to cause massive swelling around the nine months to one year after infection. Other major takeaways to know about malaria, it should be presented in a vignette where a patient has recent exposure to a place where malaria is endemic, often like Africa or somewhere in Africa. The patient will have fever, headache, anemia, splenomegaly. These are all very common. Remember, P5X and oval are on a 48-hour cycle and have a dormant form in the liver. Falciparum has a regular fever pattern. It's actually, it can be between 48 and 72 hours does have parasitized red blood cells that occlude capillaries in the brain, and that's why it causes cerebral malaria and can affect kidneys and lungs. And then malaria causes a 72-hour cycle of fevers. Chloroquine can be used for sensitive species. This blocks plasmodium heme polymerase. So if the species is resistant, you can use mefloquine or atovaquone or proguanil. And if the malaria is life-threatening, you can use IV quinidine or artusinate, which you need to first test for G6PD deficiency. For plasmodium vivax or oval, you're going to want to add primaquine to treat the hypnozoite dormant form within the liver. Also would have to check for G6PD deficiency in those as patients with G6PD deficiency who are given primaquine will be at an increased risk for hemolysis. Definitely something you do not want to do in a patient that already has malaria. So that's probably the shortest episode we're going to have in our microbiology series, but I think we covered malaria and the high-yield parts that you need to know for step one, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome back, Boards Insiders. I'm your host, Elizabeth Beeman, and I have a great microbiology question for you today. So without further ado, let's get started. Our question is, a 14-year-old boy presents to the office with chief complaint of one day of profuse, watery, non-bloody, malodorous diarrhea. He has severe abdominal cramping, vomiting, and fatigue. He reports three days ago he was camping with his family in the mountains and drank water from a stream. Vital signs are within normal limits. His physical examination is only significant for some very mild dry mucous membranes. Which of the following is most likely to be present in this patient's stool? A. Larvae. B. Multinucleated trophozoites. C. O. Cysts on acid fast stain. Or D. Ovum. And the correct answer is B. Multinucleated trophozoites. So what's our diagnosis in a patient who has profuse malodorous, watery, non-bloody diarrhea after they drank from a stream or some other natural body of water, we're going to think about Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia exists in two forms, this multinucleated trophozoite we mentioned and also a cyst form. Both of the cyst and the multinucleated trophozoite can be found in the stool. The cyst is the form that you actually ingest and it's often present in unfiltered water sources. Entamoeba histolytica is the other protozoan that also exists in a cyst in multinucleated trophozoite form. The difference clinically between Giardia and Entamoeba is that while Giardia is this kite-shaped protozoan with this long flagellated tail, and Giardia works by binding to the small intestine mucosa, preventing absorption of fat, and creating this just very great amount of fatty sometimes described as greasy stool, which is very malodorous, causes a lot of abdominal bloating and gas and pain. Entamoeba histolytica invades the intestinal mucosa, so it's going to create a bloody diarrhea. Again, pass the same way in a very similar life cycle. Both are protozoans. However, it does have a different clinical picture, or multinucleated trophozoites would have also been the right answer for a patient infected with entamoeba histolytica. Another protozoan that we can talk about now is cryptosporidium. And cryptosporidium is associated with answer choice C, which was oocysts on acid fasting. What you need to remember is that cryptosporidium is very prevalent in unfiltered water. It is transmitted through the actual oocysts present in the water. It does cause outbreaks of diarrhea and often you'll see this in in little babies. However, a competent 
an immunocompetent person is usually able to fight off this infection and it's a self-limited kind of diarrhea. In a patient who has some kind of immunocompromise, like an AIDS patient or someone who's on immunosuppressants because they've received an organ transplant, maybe a vignette would describe a patient on chemotherapy with a protracted course of diarrhea that's very profuse, very watery, maybe multiple liters a day. You want to be thinking about cryptosporidium because those patients will have a, a much different clinical picture than the average person who gets infected with cryptosporidium. In fact, 5% of people, some studies have shown, are just naturally carrying around cryptosporidium in their intestines without having any symptoms. So the big difference is that cryptosporidium is one that we want to associate with AIDS and immunocompromised people. It is still a serious cause of diarrhea. The other answer choices that we are given actually refer to an infection with a nematode, a, a roundworm. So answer choice A was larvae. I want you to associate larvae with strongyloides stercoralis. And if you remember what strongyloides is, it is also called threadworm. It causes an intestinal infection and does cause vomiting. It can cause a lot of epigastric pain. Often will be hard to tell a patient in this vignette from a patient with like a peptic ulcer. But the difference is going to be some exposure to these potential larvae. And the primary mode of transmission is through the skin. The larvae actually will penetrate the skin through soil. So they'll discuss in the vignette a patient who's been walking around barefoot, maybe in an area where this is uh, more endemic. But really, anyone walking around barefoot in the dirt is potentially could get these threadworms. Ivermectin or bendazoles are used to treat strongyloides. The other nematodes that come through penetrating the skin are Ancelostoma duodenal and Necator americanus. Those are going to be the correct answer for answer choice D, which was ovum, because the difference is that even though Necator americanus and Ancelostoma duodenal, also called hookworms, also penetrate through the skin in order to create their infection, they are going to have ovums present in the stool not the larvae. These patients with hookworms, if you remember the life cycle of the hookworm, it does pass into the lung. It basically goes from foot to the lung and then also intestine to lung if it's ascaris. The patient with hookworm will have the diarrhea, abdominal pain, will see weight loss. Often the hookworms are sucking so much blood from the wall of the intestine that the patient can be presenting with a primarily iron deficiency anemia. So you want to ask about any potential rashes on their feet that they may have had, where at the site of where the penetration happened with the larvae, they will often have like a rash. So the historical context that we're given for this patient presentation, along with diarrhea and potentially infiltrates on chest x-ray. Also, obviously, we want to remember eosinophilia and we want to think about an iron deficiency anemia. All of these things we could see in a vignette that's describing a patient with a hookworm infection. That's the big difference with hookworms. Additionally, in our discussion of parasites, I do want to mention pinworms or Enterobius vermicularis. Remember, these are the ones we see in little kids with the itchy anal area. The tape test is used to see eggs around the anus. These are transmitted fecally orally, also treated with bendazoles. And then Trichinella spiralis causes another intestinal in infection. The larvae enter the bloodstream and actually will insist inside of muscle cells, cause inflammation. Remember, trichinosis is like a clinical picture of a patient who ate some undercooked pork, or pork is the most common, but really any undercooked meat, and then developed fever with vomiting and nausea. If they have periorbital edema, you want to be thinking about this. And most importantly, or most specifically, the myalgia is associated with trichinosis. Trichinosis is also treated with bendazoles. I want to make sure that we're covering the worms that we really need to in order to get you up to date for step one. So the other high yield worms to know are the cestodes or tapeworms. Tinea solium, if you remember, is either going to cause an intestinal tapeworm or we have cystocercosis and neurocystocercosis. Now, if it's going to be an intestinal tapeworm, the way that the patient will, will have ingested it from a, a larvae, which was insisted in like undercooked pork, you treat that with praziquantel. Cystocercosis or neurocystocercosis comes after ingestion of the eggs contaminated with human feces. Praziquantel, albendazole, 
um, is also the treatment for neurocysticosis. Diphlobothrium latum will cause a vitamin B12 deficiency because this tapeworm actually eats vitamin B12 in the intestine and leads to a anemia that we would usually see associated with alcoholism or vitamin deficiencies. Specifically, it's going to be a megaloblastic anemia. And diphlobothrium latum is transmitted through ingestion of the larvae from usually fish. So think of latum with the fish. And praziquantel is the treatment for that. Let's just talk about really quickly the visceral infections. So there's some other protozoan. Trypanosoma cruzi causes Chagas disease. Remember, this is called the kissing bug. It's in feces deposited in a a bite, and it causes megacolon, megaesophagus. Primarily, we're going to see this in a patient that's been in South America. We treat it with benzonidazole or nifertamox. And leishmaniasis or visceral leishmaniasis is caused by leishmania donovani. causes spiking fevers, enlarged spleen, enlarged liver, pancytopenia. Remember that this is transmitted from sand flies. And we treat this with amphotericin B. As far as sexually transmitted infections, we have a trichomonas vaginalis. It causes a, a foul-smelling discharge. Also will be seen as a trophozoite on the wet mount and associated with that term strawberry cervix. Metronidazole is given to the patient. And you also would treat the partner for an infection with trichomonas vaginalis. So those are our big parasites that we wanted to cover for step one. Stay tuned for the next episode, and thanks for listening.